Hi, good day dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Jihad and our today's lecture is a continuation of the series uh, that we have started what surgeons should know and it's about uh, the diverticular disease and to be more specific it's about the colonic diverticular disease uh, and the term colonic diverticular disease is a spectrum of diseases with wide range of variation it this this can include uh, if we are talking about the presentation it may be just simple mild abdominal pain till peritonitis and severe abdominal pain it may be asymptomatic up to symptomatic it can be uncomplicated up to complicated uh, 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 disease and uh, 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 about the site the colonic diverticular disease actually the diverticulum which as you know it's a outpouching or herniation of part of the uh, bowel wall uh, through a weak point uh, and as you see in the picture here uh, 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 it can happen uh, at any site in the GI tract from the esophagus till the last part of the sigmoid uh, actually the most common location is the colon which is the uh, 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 subject of our uh, uh, lecture today uh, it can present in the as you see here in the uh, 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 macle diverticulum as a macle diverticulum uh, it can uh, it can present in the duodenum pharynx esophagus stomach jejunum appendix ileum uh, but actually the most common site is the colon and the, more specifically the sigmoid and we will see in the next few minutes that a, a, a diverticulum at different site carries different natural history of development. Uh, it can be congenital and true depending on the site and the way uh, it appears. Uh, okay, if we are talking about a complicated diver, uh, uh, diverticular disease that means there are diverticuli with one of five items uh, this if one of them met makes the diagnosis as complicated diverticular disease these are free perforation we are talking here free per sorry free perforation these are fistula, abscesses, structure or obstruction. If none of them are found, so we are talking about uncomplicated diverticular disease. And if you notice that the perforation is a free perforation. So micro, micro perforation with minimal contamination doesn't make the diagnosis complicated. It is just simple uh, uncomplicated diverticular disease okay as we said there is an item as symptomatic and complicated they usually present like abdominal chronic abdominal pain not responding to ordinary uh, 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 treatment with medication in a form of antibiotic or pain killer in the following slide we are going to talk more about diverticulitis as a complication of, a di of the diverticular disease um, and this is because the diverticular disease may be complicated to diverticulosis or diverticulitis and we already talked about we have already talked about the diverticulosis which mostly present as a bleeding more specifically present as 
al our GI bleeding, which was our lecture in the past few days. Okay, uh, this is what written in uh, the in these slides. Okay, if we are talking about the incidence and epidemiology, so in general, uh, diverticular disease and diverticular related illness, whatever diverticulitis, diverticulosis, is increasing these days. This is number one. Number two, uh, uh, the incidence of the diverticular disease and diverticular related illness uh, 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 is about 5%, 4 or 5% in uh, uh, patient in their 40s and 80% uh, 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 in the patient in their 80s. So with age, there is a significant increase in the incidence of diverticulo diverticular disease and its uh, uh, complication. And I think with respect that uh, the elderly, if you pick a, a, a random healthy 80-year-old patient and you screen him, uh, they are like a gift box. Uh, you will find uh, more than what you expect. Okay. Uh, uh, among these patients who are suffering from uh, 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 diverticular disease, only 10 to 20 percent are symptomatic. Among these who are symptomatic, only 10 to 12 patients will be treated as inpatient. And among these patients who are treated as inpatient, only 10 uh, uh, to 20 patients uh, will need surgery. That makes the overall need for surgery among patients who have diverticular disease is less than one. Okay. Uh, some literatures uh, say that diverticular disease present in men in young age and in women in older ages. And here is a slide. You see here it's written that more common in men less than 50 and women above 50. And you can see this slide that men more in men in these who are less than 40s and more in female who are above the 70s. An association found between diverticular disease of the colon and gallbladder stone and hiatus hernia and they call it St. Triad. And by the way, they are mostly asymptomatic. Okay, let's move to talk about the histopathology and etiology. And many literatures says that the word diverticulitis, as we said, we are going to talk more about the diverticulitis, diverticulosis. We already uh, uh, reviewed it in the lower GI bleeding lecture. So the word diverticulitis is uh, 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 a misnomer. is It's not correct. Actually, what happened uh, that when the diverticulum uh, uh, get inflamed, actually it's due to a perforation in the diverticulum or micro perforation of the diverticulum and leakage of contaminated material around the diverticulum to the surrounding tissue, which make it a peridiverticular issue 
more than diverticulitis. So some literature call it periverticulitis. And we have to keep in mind that this concept, in general, diverticular disease or diverticulitis per se, is not a, 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 a stage before the cancer. It's natural development history is not to progress to cancer. It is not a precancerous condition. Yes, they may coexist with cancer, with inflammatory bowel disease, with irritable bowel disease, but it is just coexistent, not a stage before uh, the malignancy. Okay, I, I I know that explaining what what is diverticula comes a little bit late in the lecture, but uh, I suppose that most of you can recognize that divert diverticula is like outpouching. It's like herniation of part of the bowel, and they are actually or mainly divided to two main types. These are the true diverticula, uh, and they are usually congenital, and false diverticula, which are acquired. False or pseudo-diverticula, sometimes they call it. What makes the true diverticula true? That it contains all the bowel layer, including the muscular bowel. If you can see here, this is a diverticula, and all the layer of the bowel are contained within the diverticula. Versus the uh, uh, pseudo diverticula or the false diverticula, the mucosa and submucosa only that herniate. It herniate through a natural defect, through a weak point. It is the point where the feeding vessel of the bowel uh, wall enter. So, uh, 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 so uh, 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 at this defect, they herniate, and the muscularis, as you see in this picture, the muscularis layer is in. Tact. This is false pseudo diverticula. This is uh, uh, acquired, and this type is the type of our colonic diverticula. Uh, okay, about the site, where does the diverticula, or specifically the colonic diverticula, occur? It occur if we divide it. This is a cross section of the bowel and. If we divide it like this, this is the anti-mesentric side and this is the mesentric side. And they occur in the mesentric side of the anti-mesentric tinei. So they are uh, 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 toward the mesentric side at this side. This is the diverticula, this is the diverticula. It's not here actually. It is toward the mesentric side of the anti-mesentric tinei. These are the tinea coli we are talking about. I hope I make it easy, but I don't uh, think I can make it easier than that. It occurs in the mesentric side of the anti-mesentric T9. Okay, you can take a close look. This is the anti-mesentric T9 coli. Um, these are the diverticulum. This is the side the mesentric side, these are the anti-mesentric tinicoli, as we said, this is the mesocolon. Okay. About the, the, the etiology and the pathophysiology, how does diverticula occur? There are many explanations, and one of them is uh, the collagen synthesis, Either overproduction or underproduction of collagen can explain the uh, overgrowth of the diverticula. And if, uh, if we are talking at the tissue level, so 
uh, increased in the tissue inhibitor of metalloproteases, which are responsible for degradation of collagen, may play role. Another uh, theory uh, 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 about the development of the colonic diverticula is the motility of the colon. Actually, the motion of the colon is a segmental. It's it doesn't move as a one piece, it moves as chompers. And these chompers are separate one from the another. And the intraluminal pressure, when one chamber close and separate from the other colon, increases rapidly and make the pressure inside the bowel wall high, which facilitate herniation of the mucosa in uh, the weak point that we talk about, it is where the feeding vessel or the vasa recti enter the mesenteric side of anti-mesenteric border, uh, the site where the vasa recta enter. This is the weak point and this is where herniation occur. Okay, another explanation of how does diverticula occur or why does diverticula occur is the Laplace law, which is the equation that make the relation between the pressure tension uh, divided, uh, the pressure equal tension divided by the radius and the sigmoid have uh, a, a, a small uh, uh, diameter so makes the pressure high uh, another theory are the presence of interstitial cell osteogel, which are responsible for generation of the segmental movement actually another explanation or association is the connective tissue, tissue disease which if present may also be associated or responsible for severe diffuse diverticular disease. Okay. Also, the overactivity of the cholinergic receptors play role in the diverticular disease. And here, this is actually the segmentation of the bowel actually it moves like a chamfers what they write that segmentation is the motility process in which segmental muscular contractions separate the lumen into chamfer and it may be responsible for diverticulosis if the question about is a hereditary theory exist or is, a, is there is a genetic explanation exist? And the answer is yes. And actually the progression of diverticular disease is a multifactorial. It, the, the diet, the microbiome, microorganism, the lifestyle, and also the genetic are involved. And if we are talking about the genetic or the hereditary theory, so studies found, yes, that there is correlation. There is an increase uh, in the uh, 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 presence of uh, diverticular disease and the recurrence among uh, those uh, who have family member with diverticular disease. Uh, uh, some studies uh, uh, also highlight the uh, diverticular disease in homozygotic and uh, monozygotic uh, mono, uh, and dizygotic twin, and they found that there is an increase in the uh, diverticular disease among the monozygotic twins. Um, Okay, about the gene, it's not well studied like uh, uh, cancers, uh, like colon cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. But actually, if you are interested or you can remember so that there is a gene, these are genes that may be 
associated with diverticular diseases. Also, here one lamb lamb P4. Actually, I didn't, I do not remember them by heart. These genes are associated with uh, diverticular disease. Okay, uh, let's move about the microbiome. And the microbiome is this microorganism which lives in the in or on the human uh, organism uh, and they are potentially harmful. Uh, this may be bacteria, fungus, fungal or viruses and the, the, their genetic study or the combination of the organism and the genetic uh, picture of them is what we call the microbiome. And the studies found that, yes, there is association between change, alternation of the normal microorganism in a healthy patient and those who present with diverticular diseases. Uh, for example, okay. Uh -huh. Here, for example, they found that the level of bacteria that are responsible of uh, 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 metabolizing the fiber to short chain fatty acid, which is a crucial for the colon and the colonic mucosa, is decreased. Another study found that there is alternation, there is a less clostridium in the uh, patient with diverticular disease. Another study also found that there is more, if we see here, more mm, mm, they found that pro-bacteria uh, more in this patient, uh, proteobacteria. I'm looking for bifidobacteria, also the role of bifidobacteria, uh, oh here, yes, uh, that the level of bifidobacteria is higher uh, in patients with diverticular disease. Actually, why I'm not uh, 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 delivering clear information about that, because these are just a study uh, on the theory level and there is it's not clear whether either uh, it is a causal or a simply association between the microbiome or microorganism and the development of diverticular disease okay let's move a little bit and talk about the risk factor of the disease and first we are going to talk about the rule of fibers and deficiency of fibers play a role in the development of diverticular disease and this is because fiber itself make we are talking here make the uh, 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 more frequent bowel motion faster colonic transient time so the bowel evacuation is faster and the stool is a large uh, in volume this will uh, uh, decrease a little bit the intraluminal uh, 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 pressure of the colon and prevent uh, formation of diverticulosis and diverticulitis uh, uh, also and there, they found some study found that uh, these patients who have diet uh, deficient in fiber have 15 fold uh, greater uh, 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 in the development of diverticular disease, and specifically these patients who are a meat eater compared to vegetarian. Um, also, 
uh, the uh, here uh, here also they talk about the fermentation of fiber which provide butyrate which we know it is the nutrients of the colon uh, also fibers can be from uh, fruits vegetables or cereal and they found that fibers from fruit and vegetables are more protective than food from cereals like nuts or okay uh, the western diet is a risk factor okay well, if we are talking about the western diet we talk about the meat the high fatty diet the recommended dose of uh, uh, fiber intake per day for adult it's about 20 to 35 uh, gram per day also one study highlight the relationship between the nuts corn seeds and popcorn uh, 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 and the development of the diverticular disease and to be honest there are different li uh, literature saying that there is association they increase the nuts corn seeds and popcorn increase the risk of diverticular disease and another literature says that there are no relations about the age as a risk factor we already said that about four percent or five just to remember four percent in 40 eight percent in 80s and uh, uh, also young younger patient uh, is not associated with worse clinical outcome yes younger patient when we discover diverticulosis in young patient that means more recurrence as he will live longer than elderly more recurrence more uh, it's a chronicity the chronic type will appear but that doesn't make it uh, worse uh, that doesn't make it uh, complicated no association between young and complicated young and worse presentation or deterioration uh, it's associated with recurrence that's okay it's associated with chronicity yes it's associated with more hospitalization but not with worse outcome okay as we said also about the sex and the gender uh, a classic teaching information yes it's more common in men we already said that uh, younger in younger age more common in men as we get older it be, it appear in women more but uh, as a general rule it's more common in men and the ratio is about three to uh, two uh, okay okay uh, Okay, also another study reported that if diverticular disease appear before 65 years, so it's more likely to be in men and uh, younger patient present with more severe CT finding than female. Male younger patient present with more severe uh, 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 presentation uh, than female uh, as we get older the women are at high risk for treatment failure when managed as outpatient actually it's matter of young or old the younger patient is more likely to be male more likely to be worse in compared to female to young female if we get older female if it present an old female it more likely to uh, uh, to be a high risk to be at risk of uh, 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 treatment failure uh, actually here's an information they says that men with diverticular disease more likely to bleed and women more likely to develop bladder fistula about the physical activity yes there is a association and physical activity decreases 
the risk of diverticular disease, especially the vigorous physical activity, the heavy physical activity. Smoking and alcohol also, uh, historically or in the past, they uh, uh, think that there are no association between smoking. Recently, they found that among who, those who smoke, the relative risk is multiplied by three uh, compared to non-smoker. Uh, so it is more in small curves where it is here. The relative risk associated during complication about three compared to ever smoker. The alcohol, yes, there is also an association between uh, the uh, alcoholic and uh, diverticular disease, but this association is it due to the alcohol itself or because these patients who are alcoholic have worse diet habit, it's not clear. About the steroid, yes, there is, uh, it could be a risk factor for development of uh, complicated and uncomplicated diverticular diseases. And this is maybe due to the inhibition of the prostate glandine inhibition of sox cyclooxygenase and decreased of prostate glandine also immunocompromised is a risk factor opiates also increase the intracolonic pressure and the slow intestinal transient time so we avoid as a general rule morphine in the treatment of Diver, uh, diverticular disease. Uh, the obesity, yes, there is a relation between the obesity uh, and the diverticular disease and the relative risk for diverticular disease and complication is about two for every five unit increase in the body mass. Index. To make it easier, yes, the more obese the patient, the more likely to develop diverticulosis okay until now we talk about the uh, histopathology the etiology uh, we uh, review the risk factor and we are now going to talk on the uh, pathological level and uh, the features of the colon uh, with diverticular diseases and we were going to talk about Henshi classification. Henshi classification, by the way, it's not radiological. It appears not as a radiological classification. It's more, uh, it then progressed to radiological, but it's, it's first uh, started as a pathological classification. And we have to remember that there are a microscopic feature for diverticulitis, and these include thickening thickening of the lamina propria and mucine depletion and penet cell hyperplasia penet cell these are one of the cells that line the mucosa of the bowel crypt abscess and ulceration are associated with diverticulitis and also with inflammatory bowel disease as well uh, as i said hinchy uh, develop a pathological criteria to classify, to classify the severity of the disease. And this is from 1 to 4. And we will see in the uh, next few slides that there is a modified Henshi. And modified Henshi all here, that the radiological manifestations of prayer rule. Okay, about Henshi. Okay, as we said, they are 4 and this uh, picture can help us. Stage one, Henshi is a pericolic, pericolic or mesenteric abscess. And this is make it up. This is Henshi one, where only pericolic and mesenteric abscess develop. In a stage two, pelvic, the word pelvic, it's confined to the pelvis. An abscess that is in the 
pelvis. You can see here large abscesses extending to the pelvis. It originates from the colon and extend to the pelvis. And in stage one, it is around the colon and pericolic or up to the mesentery, mesentric abscesses. If we are talking about stage three, so we are talking a lot about purulent peritonitis, contaminated peritonitis. Here is stage four, uh, three, and stage four, it is fecal material uh, that make the generalized fecal peritonitis. And as you can see here, this is a fecal discharge and in she four. Actually, it's important to remember as it guide us not only about the severity, but also toward the proper treatment. So these are Henshi classification. We said the first is pericolic or mesentric, local, and stage two, it extends down to the pelvis. Stage three, it's purulent. Stage four, it is stool. It is fecal peritonitis. About the clinical manifestation and physical finding. And as we uh, mentioned that uh, a diverticular disease is a spectrum of disease. It can be symptomatic, asymptomatic. It can be complicated and complicated. So according to that, the clinical manifestation will be uh, uh, different and have uh, multiple presentations and the physical finding will vary. But it's wisdom to remember that about 95 of patients who is admitted with peritonitis due to diverticular disease have no history of a previous admission. So they, they present as a first presentation. This patient, only 10% of them will present with recurrence uh, will uh, will recur again and if the attack is twice so about 70 percent will present with diverticular disease so 95 percent will present as a first presentation no previous history only 10 percent will develop diverticulitis or diverticular related illness after the first attack and 70% will present after the second attack. And here you can see in this picture how diverticulosis can present, actually it can present, or diverticular, we call it diverticular disease of the colon. It can be asymptomatic, it can present as Bleeding, it can present as diverticulitis and asymptomatic is about 70%. And among these who present with diverticulitis, it could be simple or complicated, the complication we already talked about. As I told you, many presentations, this include non-inflammatory diverticular disease. It's just abdominal pain with no inflammation, no systemic inflammation. If we say acute diverticulitis so please remember the Hinchy classification these are the acute presentation of diverticulitis including the localized abscess the, uh, the, 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 the abscess that extend to the pelvis stage 2 purulent and fecal peritonitis these are complicated acute complicated acute diverticulitis Diverticulitis. Okay, if we are talking about chronic diverticulitis, so these are uh, 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 the patient who remain uh, 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 symptomatic despite the standard treatment. If we are, uh, if we add the word atypical, so that means that there are no systemic sign 
in a form of fever or no leukocytosis. This is atypical diverticulitis. If we are talking about complex diverticular disease, so this is chronic plus the complication we talk about fistula structure and obstruction. And common presentation uh, of this uncommon presentation, the young patient. The young patient, we said that they are more likely to be male, they are more likely to be hospitalized again, recurrence, chronic, but there are no relation between the young patient and the severity of the disease. Yes, if the initial CT was, uh, or, or the, 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 the index CT was severe, uh, 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 manifestation, there was severe manifestation, so this means that uh, he may require intervention more likely, but that there is no relation between the complicated uh, diverticulitis and the younger age. Uh, rectum, we said that the diverticular can develop anywhere in the GI tract from the esophagus up to the end of the sigmoid and we didn't include the rectum. The rectum is a rare site and some literature says that it there will there will be never diverticulosis or diverticulitis in the rectum as the tinea coli actually converge at the upper rectum and it's it reinforces the uh, site uh, the, the, the wall of the rectum so rarely to find rectal diverticula and if it if it was found we manage it conservatively diverticular disease and diverticulitis per se are more common in the left side more common in the sigmoid if we found diverticular disease or diverticulitis in the right side that means it's sequel most commonly or the ascending colon these are usually true diverticulum uh, they are more common in the far east in japan uh, and they more commonly present in younger patient they are usually confused with the appendicitis and if you proceed for appendectomy and you find diverticula uh, or diverticulitis uh, definitely you have to remove the appendix and whether you do right hemicolectomy or diverticulectomy uh, a concept of the uh, also the, the the giant colonic diverticulum uh, any diverticulum above four centimeter in size is giant giant uh, colonic diverticulum which is like a a, a, a valve that permit entering the gas and uh, doesn't allow it to uh, leave so uh, it is a large gas filled cavity you can see it here it require actually resection uh, a rare cases of transverse colonic diverticulum also reported here you can see in this picture how diverticular uh, uh, and fat stranding and uh, pericolic fat stranding are noted uh, due to the diverticular disease. If you found uh, or a patient admitted to you to the to your beds and uh, uh, due to diverticulitis and he developed joint this, so you have to remember of bilo. Flipitis. It's widespread of the infection through the portal vein to the uh, liver, and bilophlebitis can develop jaundice and hepatic abscesses. Uh, the differential diagnosis actually here we have any patient with abdominal pain, especially elderly, we have to keep in mind cancer and we have to always rule out cancer 
among this patient with suspected diverticular disease, we should also keep in mind appendicitis. Remember that the cecum is redundant. It could be on the right side. Uh, also, uh, you have to think of the complication. Uh, diverticulitis can present as a bowel obstruction due to the stricture. Uh, rupture, abdominal aortic aneurysm, colorectal cancer, ischemic colitis, uh, pyelonephritis, gynecological diseases, pelvic inflammatory disease, diseases, also uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn disease. And here I have to mention, if we surgically treated diverticular disease, Proper treated. We treat. We resect all the symptomatic diverticuli, and the recurrence. There and the patient present again with the same manifestation. This rise our suspicious about either cancer or inflammatory bowel disease, as the diverticular disease itself is not a progressive, uh, and there are no. If properly treated, there are no recurrence in the natural history of the disease. Other diagnoses also should be kept in mind like endometriosis, tubo ovarian abscesses, pelvic inflammatory disease, renal stone, valvulus, stercoral ulcer, and ovarian torsion. As I said, we have to keep in mind the concept colorectal cancer. There is a strong association between the polycystic kidney disease and the development of sigmoid diverticulosis and in some centers those patients who are going for renal transplant they recommend sigmoid colectomy before the transplant about the history and physical exam and the classic uh, uh, history and physical finding to find in uh, these patients are the left-sided abdominal pain and the leukocytosis, the tenderness. Uh, and always when I reach the history topic, I mentioned that there will be a separate lecture of how to take proper surgical history from a, 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 the, from a surgical patient. But... By the way, the pain can be a crescendo quality, which is worse each day, worse than the, worse than the previous day, or the pain can be constant. And we have to know how we can analyze the pain according to Socrates, for example. Fever usually present. We say that it may not present if it is atypical diverticular diseases. Uh, always when we are talking about the physical finding, remember the complication of the uh, diverticulitis. These are the free perforation. These are the stricture, the fistula. So you have to uh, 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 look for these complication. For example, uh, if it is localized uh, uh, perforation, so just tenderness you will find. If you are uh, talking about uh, fecal uh, peritonitis, there will be rigidity. Uh, um, it may present like as a, a bowel obstruction and nausea and vomiting if there is a structure as a complication of diverticulitis the patient may even doesn't do not present to you he may present to the urologist or gynecologist if there is colo uh, vesical or colo vaginal fistula uh, 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 if there is an abscess or phlegmon you can feel a palpable mass in the abdomen um, okay Of course, you have to remember that the sigmoid is redundant. It may present as a right-sided abdominal pain. Not only that, but also the presence of right-sided uh, diverticular disease is a well-established entity. Mm -hmm. 
if it's if there is a bleeding so please think of diverticulosis related bleeding or uh, cancer more than diverticulitis itself we said it may present colobozygal fistula okay uh, we said that it may be symptomatic and complicated the sole manifestation of this patient are chronic abdominal pain with no laboratory finding or uh, systemic finding okay about the diagnostic evaluation uh, first of all we have uh, th there were many studies that try to figure out a correlation between the laboratory study and the severity of the disease uh, of course we have to remember that there is leukocytosis and they study the relationship between the C-reactive protein and the severity of the diseases. Actually, it's uh, there is a lack of a study, but as a classic teaching information, we can see that we can say that 150 is a cutoff point. If this, uh, if the C-reactive protein above 150, this is more likely to be associated with more complicated diverticular disease. Uh, another marker is the procalcitonin, uh, also uh, as a an, uh, an laboratory marker of the diverticular diseases. As we are talking about the diagnostic, uh, the laboratory, we said the white PC, the left shift of the white PC, the CRP, the procalcitonin. Uh, uh, the radiological investigations actually. In the past, we talk more about, talk more about talked more about the rule of the enemas, the rule of the uh, abdomen X-ray and plain films. In this time, the investigation of choice is CT scan, computed tomography. Actually. The, the 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 flat and upright plane film can help us in cases of obstruction in cases of free perforation if there is gas and under, under the diaphragm particularly the barium enema or the water soluble enemas uh, 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 are particularly helpful if there is intestinal obstruction and suspected to be due to diverticular disease. So we can see, as in this picture, the sole uh, appearance of the sigmoid. So enemas only now for those with diverticular disease or suspected diverticular disease who are suffering from uh, uh, obstruction okay we have to remember that any young patient should be seen by the gynecologist and a pregnancy test should be ordered okay actually the CT scan now is the gold standard not because it figure uh, it, it, it detect the diverticular disease and the diverticulosis but it can scan another pathology if there is hepatic abscess, if there is a pelvic abscess, if there is peri, uh, 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 free fluid uh, due to perforation. The CT finding correlates with the severity, the mortality, the morbidity. It also guides us toward the percutaneous drainage. Uh, okay, and... Uh, also, if we are talking about the percutaneous drainage, there is a cutoff point that uh, I think we will talk about this uh, later. Actually, the sign that uh, uh, is found on the CT uh, that suggests diverticular uh, disease and diverticular uh, and diverticulitis. These are pericolic fat stranding. Uh, 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 colonic wall thickening, fat stranding, colonic wall thickening more than 4 mm. We are talking about the thickness of the bowel wall and abscess 
for me and we said that there is also uh, the cities can can figure out the complication in a form of fistulas and obstruction hepatic abscesses uh, there the, 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 uh, is a classification that uh, 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 classified the ct finding to mild diverticulitis and severe diverticulitis and the point is that there is remember correlation between the ct finding and the clinical presentation if you are seeing a severe or mild diverticulitis on the CT, we will see what does this mean. This will reflect on the clinical, uh, clinically on the patient. And uh, the first who uh, study that is Ampro CT. And Ampro CT CT criteria is the following. They divided it to mild diverticulitis. These are CT finding. These are mild diverticulitis and severe diverticulitis. Mild diverticulitis, if the wall thickening is more than 5 mm, and there is pericolic fat stranding only, not more than the thickness of the wall is more than 4 or 5, and fat stranding pericolic. Severe, if the wall thickening is more than 5, if there is fat stranding, if there is abscess, extra luminal air and extra luminal contrast combined together, all together, means that this is severe diverticulitis. Why is this important? Again, it will reflect on the patient clinical status. So remember, and it also guides us what to look for in the CT scan. It's the wall thickening. It's the fat stranding, it is the abscess, it's the extra luminal air and extra luminal uh, contrast. Okay, as I said, there is a correlation. Okay, we already talked about Henshi classification and we said that this is a pathological classification. Actually, there is a modified Henshi classification that also correlate with the CT finding. So modified is a radiological uh, classification. And it's important as it also guides our treatment and correlate with the severity. The difference is we said that uh, Henshi is from one to four, modified Henshi from zero to four plus plus. We will see here that Henshi classification zero here is just a colonic wall thickening, not more than that. Grade two, a grade one A consists of wall thickening plus pericolonic fat stranding. P means pericolonic or mesentric abscess. So zero just wall thickening a one it is thickening and uh, uh, a fat stranding b one b is abscess two two is pelvic abscess and three four it is uh, purulent and fecal peritonitis this classification is important I, I should repeat the sentence as it's crucial, uh, it, it guides our treatment. Uh, you can see here the diaphragm, here is the Henshi classification, and here is the modified Henshi classification. Zero is a mild clinical diverticulitis in a form of colonic wall thickening, 1A in a form of uh, uh, pericolic fat stranding or mesentric fat stranding, uh, B, it's abscess, uh, uh, pericolic abscess, uh, 2 is uh, pelvic abscess, 3 purulent, 4 fecal peritonitis, plus plus this, I, I mean by plus plus the fistula can be mentioned in Henshi as fistula, Henshi slash fistula, these are 
colovesical, vaginal, and enteric or cutaneous, and obstruction could be found in CT. Okay, these are pictures. Actually, uh, I want to be uh, limited to the script of the what was written in the lecture, but I have to mention that you can consume your life in as a surgeon in trying to figure out the CT finding of diverticulosis, of hepatic diseases, of colonic obstruction. But it's like a school. Some surgeons are interested. Other think that it's not my job to spend my life uh, trying to understand the CT uh, scan. And um, actually, I think that the surgeon have more important uh, thing to learn and to figure out more than taking it uh, deep in the radiological study. Um, but at any way, I said that because I mentioned here the that you can see in front of you a CT finding where diverticula is seen as a pericolic fat stranding uh, are also seen here also there is ileal diverticula with fat stranding the hinge we already talked about and you can see here an abscess formed and diverticula Okay, about the endoscopic evaluation and the endoscopic evaluation in a form of colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy is recommended after the attack of acute diverticulitis um, in a six weeks after that four to six weeks after that in order to the inflammation to subsided and not converting a sealed micro perforation to open perforation and we do endoscopy to look for other diagnoses such as malignancy inflammatory bowel diseases and actually they are rare rare to found uh, a, a malignancy for example the percentage of uh, a finding malignant process after uncomplicated diverticulitis is about one and about seven in complicated which is uh, m m more crucial to do endoscopy in patient who are who, who present with complicated diverticulitis than uncomplicated diverticulitis. Um, we said we should wait six weeks until the uh, symptoms subsided a little bit. Um, also, to screen... Uh, here, how does diverticulosis looks like on the endoscopy? We actually do not, as a surgeon, do not see this view. We see this view. And uh, 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 what I have to also mention, the, here written about the, how we screen for uh, the fistula, either the colovesical or colovaginal fistula and I remember when I was a resident there were two appreciatable literature one says it is screened on cystoscopy and the other says it's screened on the CT scan on the literature that I'm talking from now it says that on the CT era and the CT uh, uh, when the CT appears the need for cystoscopy is not that crucial, especially if we found a gas in the UP without instrumentation on CT scan that is fistula. For patient with diverticular disease, that is fistula. Actually, I will not give you the answer of what 
is the investigation of so of, of choice for uh, uh, for um, clovisical fistula uh, but i remember that it was either ct scan or uh, cystoscopy okay these are the information about the endoscopic evaluation we move to the management and the management varies as the presentation itself varies as we reviewed uh, so if we are talking about the management of acute uncomplicated diverticulitis so uh, 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 this patient most likely to be managed as outpatient on oral antibiotic and uh, as I said they can manage even uh, without without surgery and outpatient or ambulatory management here we add antibiotics okay antibiotics and even some studies found treatment could be with some atypical or uh, 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 uncomplicated uh, uh, mild uh, diverticulitis can be treated even without antibiotic and if we are talking about the antibiotic so we have to cover the fecal flora these are the gram negative road and ana erupts and the common regimen we use it's flagyl and ciprofloxacin for metronidazole and ciprofloxacin for 10 days or augmentin and unicin for 10 days there is a rule for the non-absorbable antibiotic it's the rifam rifam pixin uh, which have shown to uh, improve the outcome in patient with diverticulitis ozone mesalazine which is an, an anti-inflammatory drug i know that we use it for inflammatory bowel disease but there is a, a successful treatment with mesalazine in a case of diverticular diseases regarding the dietary changes actually in the acute setting it doesn't play a role uh, as outpatient he can eat whatever what what he wants but if you admit the patient to the hospital initially we make the patient nail by mouth then we advance him to oral uh, diet um, okay uh, the, the the question we said uh, if, if it's uncomplicated acute we remember that acute could be mined based on the ct criteria based on the presentation he can be treated as outpatient if we need to when we need to hospitalize the patient this slide actually says that severe pain for example for pain management and inability to, to for oral intake this patient may present uh, due to diverticulitis bear resistance symptoms despite outpatient if i admit him with acute uncomplicated i need to make him nothing by mouth or nil by mouth initially and broad spectrum antibiotic we said in previously that morphine should be avoided at it as it increases the intracolonic pressure uh, we have to do index CT scan or screening CT scan looking for abscesses or perforation as he already admitted. Um, okay, and of course, three weeks later, we said more than that, yeah, about six weeks later, we do endoscopy to rule out cancer and a little bit later, we can do elective surgery if the patient needs surgery we will see 
in the next slide. Okay, we said uncomplicated diverticulitis can be treated as outpatient, can be treated as inpatient, uh, 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 um, depend on the patient status, symptoms, hemodynamic stability, uh, uh, tolerating the oral diet. Okay, about the complicated diverticulitis, we said that when we say complicated, acute complicated diverticulitis, these are five items in a form of fistula, free perforation, abscesses, large bowel obstruction, and we will discuss each management later, but it is individualized. Uh, every single complication have its uh, treatment. Uh, we said that Hinshi, uh, specifically modified Hinshi, direct our treatment protocol. And if we are talking about diverticular abscess, and if you remember, according to modified Hinshi, diverticular abscess was 2, 1P and 2, as 1A and 0, just fat stranding and wall thickening. So if we are talking about how to manage diverticular abscesses, so the cutoff point is three centimeter if it is if the abscess is less than three centimeter we can proceed for antibiotic otherwise above three centimeter we need to do percutaneous drainage or surgery depends on the accessibility of the uh, abscess itself and the hemodynamic stability, the general condition of the patient. Uh, of course, the okay, okay. This what written here. I don't think we already summarize. Uh, emergent surgery is appropriate for patients who do not respond for standard, not surgical. Of course, if the patient is unstable, if the patient is not responding to oral antibiotic, we have, if the patient is not feasible for uh, uh, percutaneous drainage, we have to proceed for uh, surgery. And Henshi 3, we said it is purulent. Uh, peritonitis and actually it's difficult on the CT to differentiate between Hinshi 3 and Hinshi 4 fecal peritonitis it is perforation free fluid so it's difficult and uh, this is uh, this make the uh, management a little bit uh, not clear and uh, uh, we will see that in Hinshi 3, there is a rule in the purulent peritonitis. There is a rule for a, a, a medical management, only antibiotic, and give the patient chance to be away from your knife. So there is a rule and for medical management, as we said, the problem is that we cannot clearly know, based on the CT scan, is it Hinshi 3 or Hinshi 4. Also, I will recognize the procedure for Hinshi 3, which is a purulent peritonitis, is the laparoscopic lavage. Actually, what we do is irrigation and evacuation of the contaminated material laparoscopically. And there are many studies comparing laparoscopic lavage versus a uh, Hartman procedure, they found that uh, there is an increase in the rate of serious short-term uh, uh, adverse event in the lavage group. Um, also, they found that uh, in the laparoscopic patient, patient who underwent laparoscopic lavage in Hinshi 3 are more likely to need surgical re-intervention and more likely to develop deep abscess, peritoneal and pelvic abscess, not superficial abscess. Superficial abscess is lower 
uh, I mean skin one uh, 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 or percutaneous abscesses are lower rate in laparoscopic lavage but, but deep abscesses and um, uh, uh, re -inter and re intervention the need for surgery for uh, resectional surgery is more uh, uh, likely in high in laparoscopic lavage the mortality is and morbidity is the same when we compare traditional surgery or heart manual procedure and laparoscopic lavage man study compared between the two there are lower rate of superficial wound infection in the laparoscopic uh, group uh, but a higher rate of deep and this is due to the misdiagnosed due to we proceed to treat hinge 3 la uh, with laparoscopic lavage but we found it intraop as hinge 4 for example or we didn't we didn't pick up all the site where the contamination occur <laughs> Okay, about the technique, how we do laparoscopic lavage, actually, actually it's installing, uh, it's, it's irrigation and irrigation with saline and evacuation of the contaminated material. If there is uh, fibrous exudate, we have to remove it. Uh, we have to look carefully to the pelvis and to the retrocolic site, to the a, 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 a fibrous band if there is fibrous band we have to examine the omentum and we have to dissect the omentum of the perforation if it is easy to do that to confirm that it is not fecal peritonitis but if it is adherent and uh, it's written here I think if it's adherent no need to adhesolysis no need to remove the adhesion from the bowel wall and the omentum as it's a sealed perforation and it may be converted to free perforation um, as we said the problem in laparoscopic lavage that it is a procedure for hinge tree uh, but actually the problem that we may proceed but to patient with Henshi 3 and we found intra of that it is Henshi 4. Henshi 4. How do we treat Henshi 4? And Henshi 4, as we mentioned, it's fecal and peritonitis. And here the rule of resectional surgery, the traditional surgery appear. And actually, uh, 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 the surgery there are m multiple theories that explain what we can do in the index surgery what we should do in the index surgery and this actually depend on the stability the severity of the patient for example there is a perforation there is fecal peritonitis we did laparotomy we found fecal peritonitis and segment that is perforated we can do segmental resection here we can do a, 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 a segmental resection sigmoid colectomy uh, and uh, 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 we can uh, uh, do anastomosis between the two parts and uh, primary anastomosis and bring up an ileostomy, diverting ileostomy, as it's easier to reverse compared with the colostomy. This is one of the theory. It's just there is a perforation there is fecal peritonitis there is a contamination we do we did irrigation okay we can do resection anastomosis and diverting ileostomy diverting ileostomy it's to uh, uh, decrease the uh, pressure on the anastomotic size and it's easy 
to reverse compared to. This depends on the patient stable or not. Another, th another modality of the treatment for Henshi 4 is the Hartman procedure. The Hartman procedure is just you resect, resect the perforated part, you bring in colostomy, and the distal part you uh, uh, close it and leave it in the pelvis. And later on, and later on you will do reversal. Another modality of a treatment is just uh, uh, bringing a stoma, not in, in, in resection. Will you will never do resection? It's just you bring end colostomy, no resection. Okay, lavage, uh, uh, irrigation, cleaning the abdomen, and just bringing the astoma. And this is uh, acceptable when the surgeon is not experienced well when the. Stability of the patient doesn't allow for intervention. Uh, and if you can analyze from what I said, that this procedure can be one-step surgeries, two-step surgeries, and even three-step surgeries. And actually, the general best bitter outcome is for one-step surgery. It's doing uh, 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 resection, anastomosis, and uh, you uh, resolve the problem. For example, in Hartman procedure, it's two-step surgery. Uh, in just bringing an end colostomy, and I have to notice that there is a difference between Hartman, which we know it is end colostomy and rectal stump uh, uh, stapled, and End colostomy. Hartman, we resect the perforated part. On uh, 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 end colostomy, we do not resect the diseased part. We just bring ileostomy. Uh, we bring colostomy, and that's all. And this will need three-step procedure. This will need a second step to resect the diseased part, and a third step to do reanastomosis. And this is associated with high mortality and high morbidity. The best is to do one step surgery if it allows. And a question appears where is my margin? What is what I will resect? Is it only the site of perforation? Actually, if we are talking about diverticulosis, you need to, to resect up to the upper rectum. This is associated with lower rectus, up to the healthy upper rectum. Uh, another question arises, do I need to do oncological resection? The answer is not necessary to do high ligation, for example. It's not necessary. It's not an oncological resection. Except if, you, if there is a suspicious of uh, malignancy or your diagnosis is not sure. Here is the Hartman procedure. You see, he bring up end colostomy. He take he he already resect out the perforated part and the distal stump. He just uh, staple him or close it uh, and drop it in the pelvis for a second surgery. And another picture, I think. Um, Ah, mm, no, it's, it's Hartman also, the section formation. Okay, uh, 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 here is a picture of what we call it on table lavage. On table lavage is you do, uh, 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 we can say bowel preparation intra-op, just to permit us for one step surgery to do anastomosis, uh, resection and anastomosis uh, uh, in one step and uh, it's shown to improve the uh, uh, mortality and morbidity but I think it needs a stable patient and need experienced surgeon. How, this is intra-op, how, how did they do a one, st uh, 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 what we call it, on-table lavage. Okay. 
We said hinge four. Can we can proceed to resection anastomosis diverting ileostomy or Hartman or just in cholestomy? Here is a slide. It's not uh, one hundred percent true, but actually he says that if we are talking about hinge one, which is pericolic abscess, hinge one B and two which is pelvic or retroperitoneal abscess. So we may need CT guided drainage if it is feasible or and do elective resection later on uh, with the primary reanastomosis. Hence she three, we can do, we remember, even hence three can be treated as electively an oral antibiotic, but eventually this patient will need surgery, but in an elective bias, in an elective uh, 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 way, not an emergent, not an emergency. Uh, we do our best not to proceed for emergent surgery. Elective surgery means anastomosis, means less morbidity, less mortality. So, hinge three, we can proceed to emergent Hartman or emergent resection with the primary anastomosis. Um, Henshi 4, it's emergent Hartman procedure. If we are talking about the chronic diverticular disease, just pay attention for a while. We reviewed how we can treat diverticular disease according to the Henshi protocol, according to complicated and uncomplicated, uncomplicated, and I said about complicated, we will discuss each complication separately. But we have to remember that usually, usually, and I think it's written in, in the next few slides, uh, 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 classic teaching information that surgery is needed after a second attack. This is not a rule. It is a matter of individualization. It is a matter of the complication. It's the matter of how is the initial presentation if the patient even present with second attack uh, acute uncomplicated mild uh, uh, diverticulitis he may never need surgery and if the patient present with acute severe complicated diverticulitis even after the first episode can we uh, need uh, will need surgery so the classic teaching information in our mind that after second attack he needs surgery this is not a rule uh, it's a matter of individualization uh, we should study each case alone okay um we said that we do our best if we can if the patient uh, status permit to do it in an elective mode not an emergency mode okay about the treatment of a chronic diverticular disease and the chronic diverticular disease you remember we said that it is a matter of a uh, recurrent attack of abdominal pain usually without systemic complication and actually what's written here in chronic and complicated disease is what we already talked about that yes as a classic teaching information after a second attack we proceed for surgery but this is again not a rule uh, we should uh, individualize each case alone uh, it depends whether it's complicated and complicated uh, presentation some patient will proceed for elective for elective surgery even after the initial even after one recurrence or even after the first presentation if it was complicated and acute or with okay um, nothing uh, more than what I already said uh, the young as, as we mentioned that the young are 
more likely to be associated with chronicity, with uh, multiple recurrence. So surgery could be uh, after the first, even after the first episode alone. And also, it is a matter of individualization. The immunocompromise is uh, expected to have a higher incidence of recurrence, complication, uh, and uh, the threshold for surgery should be low. Regarding the management of fistula, actually the picture here uh, explaining the colo vesicle fistula, which is more common in female and this patient actually it may be the, the the initial presentation as i said it may they may present to the urologist or gynecologist if it is color vesical fistula so we are talking about nematuria fecaluria recurrent urinary tract infection and uh, here we can initially treat the patient with antibiotic and folus but definitely they will need surgery in a form of resection of the part of the bowel, closure of the defect in the UP, and uh, 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 interposing, putting a tissue between these two, uh, the, the omentum between these uh, two defects, and we may do uh, diverting ileostomy. The as I said, what is the investigation of choice to pick up fistula? Recently, imaging is enough, CT is enough. If there is air in the UP without instrumentation in the background of diverticulosis, this is fistula. Uh, I said, eventually, these patients need surgery to prevent urosepsis. Colovaginal fistula also a disaster and present as, uh, especially with patient with a prior history of hysterectomies. This present with gas and the stool per vagina and the imaging study is enough to pick up this uh, complication and eventually of course they need surgery uh, regarding the colocutaneous fistula we are going to talk more in details about the treatment and it depends on whether uh, colocutaneous fistula actually before the management they, they, they present if it is significant they may present like as a malabsorption a problem in the digestion uh, if it is colo I said colo cutaneous or colo enteric I'm talking about the colo enteric colo enteric fistula present as malabsorption colo cutaneous fistula it's what I said that this present with uh, colo cutaneous fistula can be managed uh, uh, medically or conservatively or surgically according is it low output or high output and we are going to talk in detail about it uh, in another uh, lecture uh, here the uh, how did they figure a fistula on a barium enema and you see they put a contrast in the colon and the ub is full of the contrast so there is a con communication between the two and here you can see between the up and the colon and here you can see how there is an ear in the bladder near the colon the presence of diverticula so this is colovesical fistula the obstruction we said the structure and obstruction or diverticulitis related obstruction Usually here, you should first of all remember that this is a benign procedure. Uh, stinting is not recommended. 
resection is what we go for and of course uh, no need for oncological resection here is a slide just summarizing the rule of surgery in an emergent background or elective surgery for example emergent operation we said like what like hartman for example or like end colostomy it's for peritonitis we are talking here it's for peritonitis uncontrolled sepsis perforation clinical deterioration and in an elective background it is the complication the fistula formation structure recurrent diverticulitis we said we do elective surgery uh, uh, after two episodes, one should be seriously considered after two uh, after a second attack. Another slide also summarizes when to do surgery, indication for surgery, who do not improve with medical therapy, patient who have at least two documented attack, uh, all patient with complicated diverticulitis, mm, and patient with recurrent or persistent hemorrhage. We talk about that in the treatment of lower GI bleeding. Another slide also, I'm just reviewing literature. Actually, it's a matter of building an imagination in your, in your brain about the diverticulitis, about the, the, the topic. Um, I, I don't want to confuse you, but actually it's similar to what we say. For example, here, an indication for operation, for elective operation, it's more than two acute attacks successfully treated medically, uh, one requiring hospitalization and less than 40-year-old complicated attack, immunocompromised patient, inability to rule out cancer, these are about the technical aspect of surgery but if we are taking talking about the surgery itself and first of all if we are talking about a, a, a surgery for diverticulitis so we need bowel preparation if time permits if we are going for elective surgery um, of course if it's an emergency we may have no time for bowel preparation and also antibiotic prior to surgery the approach and actually if we are talking about the uh, approach for elective surgery so the laparoscopic rule appear here and it's found that laparoscopic sigmoidectomy is better than the traditional open surgery in terms of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery in terms of uh, 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 hospitalization decrease the hospitalization and risk for wound infection so generally laparoscopic approach is preferred uh, here is written that the fanning steel in an open incision, the fanning steel incision, the gynecological one, is uh, associated with lower incisional hernia rate. Regarding the technique, uh, the transition margin, we said that our distal uh, resection margin is the proximal rectum, proximal healthy rectum. And the proximal, we are resecting a segment. We talk about the distal. The proximal one is the disease-free part of the sigmoid. And this is confirmed by thickening of the bowel wall. We check the bowel wall, not the diverticula. The, the bowel may be wide spread of diverticuli, so we are not going to proceed for total colectomy. It's we check that is there any healthy part of the bowel that we can do anastomosis or resection and this is as i said depend on the thickness of the bowel wall another question appear is the oncological resection necessary and this depend on either i'm sure that it is diverticular disease or there is a suspicious for cancer and this will reflect on the preservation of the inferior mesenteric artery 
and uh, in oncological resection we have to do high medical ligation this is not necessary in diverticular disease and actually it's associated in preservation of the inferior mesenteric artery it's associated with bitter outcome another question appeared is splenic flexure mandatory and it's a matter of individualization intra-op decision the 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 the, the, the idea of splenic flexure mobilization is to make the anastomosis which is low tension free no tension on the anastomosis so i have i may need to do splenic flexure mobilization actually it's associated with more infection mortality morbidity more and longer operative time but it's it may be mandatory to make the anastomosis free of tension here is the splenic flexure there are multiple ligament need to be transected the gastrocolic ligament the gastro the uh, uh, splenocolic ligament the phrenocolic ligament the pancreatocolic ligament and of course the line of tolls the lateral flexion uh, need to be uh, resected uh, and this again a matter of intra-op decision another question developed is a ureteral stent mandatory and the answer is no yes it prevents uh, injury to the uh, ureters but it's not mandatory as it takes more uh, uh, especially in diverticular disease it uh, takes more longer operative time and longer length of stay and higher cost this is the ureteral stent anastomotic leak testing we did anastomosis we proceed for elective surgery laparoscopically laparoscopic for example sigmoidectomy we do anastomosis and we are we now checking our anastomosis if there is any leak and this is done by air bubble test i think if you are practicing surgery you already see so that uh, it's submerging the bowel with fluid and checking if there is air bubble uh, coming out and uh, does it help actually the study found yes it helps uh, in uh, finding if there is a anastomosis right-sided diverticulitis we already said that right-sided are mm, a true diverticulitis may present like appendicitis uh, uh, they are usually in uh, uh, eastern eastern country in japan they are associated with lung uh, with young patient they are associated they are a true diverticulum uh, nothing specific the conclusion already uh, I think everything here uh, written here uh, we already uh, said that and we now reach the uh, end of our lecture uh, uh, thank you for whom who reached the end with me and this is my sources about uh, sources where I get my information uh, I hope that I delivered as much uh, I can from the information I have. Um, I am Dr. Jihad Al Jarrah. I am a uh, surgery specialist, general surgery specialist in the Real Medical Services and member of the uh, Real Medical uh, Services and a colorectal fellow. Uh, I'm happy if. Uh, you will write for me your feedback about the lecture and how we can improve it and i think our next lecture will be inflammatory bowel disease thank you bye bye